Thank you for being with us today. We had such a quite amazing start to our perfect beer talks with Tara Nurin last week. Today, I have great guest, Matthew Curtis, and I'm sure uh, we will keep on to learn new things. So I'm very excited to host Matthew Curtis. He's a British author and co-founder of Pelicle magazine. He is with us to have a great talk on modern beer and pop diversity. Uh, I can't wait to start second hour round. Okay, welcome, Matt. I'm really pleased to uh, you are with us today. So I know you very well from your articles and books about the beer. But would you like to introduce yourself to folks? Yes, thank you very much, Can. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Matthew Curtis. Most people call me Matt. Um, I have been writing about beer for the past 10 years. I'm also a photographer and a podcaster. And this year I became an author. I had two, bu two books published, uh, an opinionated guide to London pubs, and most recently a book called Modern British Beer, uh, which I'll be talking about a bit later. And as Can says, I am the co-founder and editor-in-chief of a drinks magazine called Pellicle, which I founded in 2019. Um, with my good friend Jonathan Hamilton, who is a, a very talented brewer. Um, and I also am a freelance writer and photographer and work for a lot of beer magazines um, and do a bit of photography for the industry as well. So I keep myself very busy. <laughs> uh, it's great. Uh, so, Matt, all of us as beer lovers have different passions for beer. For example, last week, Tara told her journey started when she was three years old by snacking small sips from her father's glass. <laughs> so what is your passion? What is your story about the beer? Well, I certainly, I didn't start drinking beer till I was three years old, but I am very <laughs> thankful to my dad, Frank, who, when I was in my late teens, 16, 17, he'd always give me interesting beers to try. I remember having Chimay, Blue and Duval uh, when I was about 16, 17 and, and, um, I don't know if I enjoyed them at the time, but it was certainly eye-opening. And as I got into my 20s, I started to drink real ale and cask beer. But something very interesting happened to me in 2010. I had an enthusiasm for beer, but my dude is from Lincolnshire in England, in the east of England. He got a he works in agriculture, or he's retired now, but he got a job in America and he moved to Colorado. And when he relocated, his company flew me and my sister over to see where he was going to live. And we got to spend two weeks in this Colorado city called Fort Collins, which is home to some incredible breweries. And on that trip, within the two weeks, I got to visit breweries like Odell, New Belgium, Oscar Blues. And I saw a different beer culture to the one we had in the UK. But I also saw a lot of excitement and a lot of potential. And I had no, uh, I worked in the musical instrument industry that was my job that's what I came for at college but I I saw this culture and I was so fascinated by it I needed to find a way of explaining this you use, you use the word passion and so I started a beer blog shortly after that trip just to write about these experiences and what can I say it's been a, a, a ride um a couple of years after self-publishing, you know, this was a hobby. I wasn't doing it for money, but new beer magazines uh, like Ferment, who I've written for for six years, they emerged and contacted me and said, would you be interested in, in writing for us? We will pay you a little bit of money. Um, Good Beer Hunting in the United States was another one. Um, and so I started writing about beer for money on top of my real job. And it got to the point where I was so busy with both. I had to make a decision and I thought, could I do this full time? And I decided to go for it. So I have been a full-time freelance beer writer since February 2016. Um, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. And I have sort of grown into that, written for more publications, um, beer publications, food publications, wine magazines, all sorts. Um, and if, this year I've even written for a, a political news website about Brewdog, for example. Uh, you know, I'm a freelance writer. But then in 2019, slightly frustrated with the state of some of the beer writing in the UK, there was a lot of good stuff, but I thought there, there needed to be more. My friend Johnny and I decided to start our own publication. And one thing we did from that is we got investment from the outset, just a little bit of money. 
and that enabled us to pay contributors. So I can essentially give the same opportunity I had six or seven years ago when I got my first paid writing gigs, and now I can commission people to do that. And that's a great thrill. And this has culminated this year in the publication of my first two books. And I'm excited that I'll be working on some new books in the future as well. Uh, so that's that's something um, uh, I'll keep doing. So I'm going to keep myself busy. It's been a long journey, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the next few years brings. Thanks for your contribution to Beer World. And <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's great to hear your journey. Okay, Matt, according to British Beer and Pub Association, there are more than 47,000 pubs. And even in London, more than 3,500. On the other hand, draft consumption in UK is totally different than the rest of the world. It's a huge amount, around 52%. Mm. So, as a guy coming from this culture, how do you make your pub choices? Well, um, that's a really good question because it's something I've been thinking about a lot since since lockdown. And what I realized in lockdown, I and mean, something that's changed in the UK is now more people will, that, that figure has changed. It's now more than 50% of people in the UK drink at home. And um, uh, and that's it means pubs are, are struggling and have to have a really good offering. Now, for me, I'm a beer guy, so I want to see a great range of interesting beer. That doesn't mean I want to see 50 taps. It means I want to see, you know, if I compared it to one of my, like some of my favorite restaurants, the best restaurants don't just put every kind of food on the menu. They choose a concise range of what they're really good at. And I want to go into a pub that has a little bit of everything that's done really well. It needs to have some great lagers. It needs to have, obviously, great pale ale IPAs. I'd like to see some darker beers, some stouts, some red ales. And in the UK, a good pub should have cask beer, real ale, because that is something that is at the centre of British beer culture, just like great Hellers is in Munich or IPA is in California. The best pubs should be centering cask ale. But again, I don't want to walk into a place and see 10, 15, 20 hand pulls three, four, five that are rotated quickly, serve fresh. So every time I go in, I know I'm getting a fresh beer because this is beer that is very perishable and needs to be sold quickly. That's what I want to see. So the beer range needs to be very concise. And I want, but something that's really important to me um, is, is atmosphere. I like to use the word vibe. Like I can walk into a pub and if, if the staff are unhappy, if, the beer is stale and tired. If the place hasn't been cleaned in a while, I don't feel comfortable. The whole point of a pub in the UK is it's this third space, right? It's the space in between work and home. It's somewhere to go and decompress. We have moments that are very fleeting in pubs where we just meet friends or maybe go for a beer by ourselves. But also we have major life events in pubs. We have weddings and funerals and christenings People get together in pubs. They break up in pubs. They meet people's parents or kids for the first time. They're these places that are so important to how we exist in the UK. Something that, for me, really came into focus. When I was writing my opinion to drive to London, a lot of that had to be done in lockdown. And I, it made me realise, because I was thinking about the place of pubs in, in our society and how, how desperately I missed them just being there the way they help you process all of the stuff that's going on. Um, but the, the other thing I want to come back to is staff, like great service is, is so crucial. And, you know, if staff are being paid well and looked after in these venues and you get served with a smile, people who are trained to serve beer. And if the pub does food, with great quality, that's fresh. That's so important to me. So that that's, you know, if I can and have a conversation with someone about the beer I'm drinking or, or what um, what I'm ordering, um, that's that's really important, and that's that's been really brought sharply into focus this year um, with the hospitality industry struggling to to staff uh, because of because of the pandemic. So yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the mixture. But I mean, I've this for an hour. There's certain magic to pubs that do it right, and I know the pubs that I like going to where I know I can sit in this seat and feel this contentment, this relaxation, joy. 
And that's something that's really hard to put your finger on. And the best pubs are the ones that can work out how to do that. And um, honestly, it's, it's, it's magic. I couldn't give you a, an answer on the full solution. But service with a smile, great beer, that certainly helps. Matthew, I totally agree with you. Uh, actually, for me, <laughs> freshness, freshness is first also. Uh, sometimes people want a suge suggestion from me. Where is the best pub exactly? I say that I say them, hey, just look at the pub in your selections map and you can realize where are the perfect beer. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on the lockdown time, uh, we, we we saw on the newspaper so many tracks on the işte London streets which which are serving draft beer. Uh, it, it could be. It was general in that time in every city. Is it easy to see that tracks or it was only in London in the lockdown time? In, term, in, in terms of people drinking outside? Yeah, in the lockdown time, uh, tracks uh, just traveling around the streets and serving draft beer to homes. So I think that was, there was a few, uh, I know there was a brewery in London that did that. Um, I think something that was really important is that breweries and pubs are Adapted to, to take away beer, so I think the trucks was a, a bit of a marketing thing. I don't it wasn't something that was mass produced, but um, certainly pubs pivoting to uh, selling growlers or flagons of beer. Uh, obviously, breweries who invested in canning lines were in a position where they could switch their draft sales to to off sales. That was really important, but um, no. There was a little bit of that, but I think it was more of a trying to get a bit of marketing rather than a, a genuine solution for selling real volume. All right. Uh, also, you say that the pub are the places between home and office. Uh, I think it's so valuable. I represent this situation, being ourselves. We be ourselves in the pubs, actually. So uh, it has a big history. There are some interesting information about it. For example, in the American colonial period, owners of pubs had higher social status than ministers. I think maybe it could be same for the pub chain owners <laughs> right, right now. Uh, but could you could you share with us uh, any interesting story from the pubs history? So I think something about what you're talking about there. Um, something is something I was talking to my dad about really is that um, the the character of the landlord I don't know if the you know probably a manager or owner is the best word to use these days but it's great when you walk into a pub and you see the person who owns it behind the bar pouring drinks coming around talking to customers you know when I talk about that vibe that atmosphere I think that that central figure who is kind of like welcoming you into their place. Um, that's, that's really crucial. Um, but stories from history. I mean, I could tell you my own story from history. I, my first, uh, my first job was in a pub. Um, although it wasn't anything glamorous. I was washing the dishes, um, uh, in, in the back. Uh, and that's, you know, that was my first, first experience i was i was underage so i couldn't technically drink but i do remember the landlord at that, that time who was a very central figure um uh, one day and i he promoted me to to wait tables take orders and serve money but he says i need you to come in an hour early but i was really excited so i went in an hour early but i had my my waiter gear on so i had a white shirt black trousers i'd shine my shoes i was ready to to serve customers um meals and he says i'm glad you're here early i need you to wash my car <laughs> <laughs> and i i held my head high i washed his car and then i served the customers with uh oil and grease my nice clean white shirt that i'd come to work in and then at the end of the day i said i won't be coming back i'm going to go and work pub down the road <laughs> and then a week later he crashed the car um so <laughs> There you go. That's that's just a good example of uh, how you should. I mean, I was 17. That was a long that was over 20 years ago. But um, you should really treat your staff 
with dignity and respect because then they will treat your customers with the same dignity and respect. And that's really important. I think so. So let's come to another important point. Sustainability is all of our passion. And SARS source limitation is, uh, is a known issue for the earth right now. Uh, also, we know that 90% of the beer comes from the water. So water is the key element for the beer production. And according to American Restaurant Association, average loss per cake is 23%. Whew, what a number. So do you think for the people, while choosing a pub or choosing a beer brand, where is the sustainability importance and uh, what does pubs do about that? That's such a great question because I've been thinking about this a lot recently. And I think when you look at sustainability in pubs, you have to expand it to look at the entire supply chain um, because I, essentially pubs, pubs are relatively sustainable businesses. They are closed. They are, they are one business. But if you follow the supply chain of some of their products, then um, and then the supply chains in those, then the sustainability unravels. Let's look at beer, for example. They could be um, maybe bringing in cask beer from a local brewery, or they could be importing kegs of beer that have been shipped or flown overseas. The beer is not actually that sustainable to produce. Relatively, in, in terms of industry, beer has a, a smaller impact on, on other uh, industries, such as uh, automobiles and aviation, for example. But... It, you know, it takes five pints of water on average to brew one pint of beer. That, you know, that is, that is not long-term sustainable. You, you need a lot of energy to, to boil liquids. You need to use a lot of chemicals. You need to get aluminium. You need to get glass. But if you're getting, if you're a local pub in, in England and you're getting cask beer from a brewery three miles down the road, who's able to source uh, their ingredients from the UK, you know, we are a producer of hops and barley in the UK, so you can get all the ingredients here. That's going to be infinitely more sustainable than than flying in uh, beer from Europe or the United States or New Zealand. The trouble is, sometimes those products are what you need to draw the customers in. I, as much as I love drinking local beer, I love to drink something new and exotic and exciting. And sometimes that means tr getting the chance to try a beer from the United States that I might not have been able to. I think pubs finding a balance on um, supporting local and not just with their beer, but with their food. Um, that's a, so, something that really needs to be invested in. Wine is another thing. If you think about when you go to the wine, you might order a New Zealand Cabernet, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon without considering that this wine has literally been shipped around the world so you can have a glass of it. Um, and something that's happening in the UK that's very interesting is that English wine is exploding and is um, there are some incredible products there as well. So I think a modern pub should be looking at a product offering that is um, uh, local and responsible while balancing, the, you know, acknowledging there is a need for products that have a certain excitement to them. Um, I mean... You, I, mean, I could I could get into problems with New, Ze New Zealand's wine exports are crucial to its economy, um, but uh, oh, it's, it's a massive problem. A couple of other things on sustainability, though. I mean, um, supporting staff as well uh, with sustainable wages uh, that that's a huge part of it. Um, but also supporting your customers. If you've got a good customer, you want them to be there for um, for you know you want them to come back and drink a lot. That means looking after them um, and. In a lot of terms these days, that may, might mean having a great alcohol-free offering. I think we might talk about this a bit more in the future, but I was incredibly skeptical about alcohol-free beer uh, for the last few years. It's only in the last 12 months that I've really got my head around how crucial it is. Um, you know, we've got January coming up and uh, praying that there's no lockdown. A lot of people will be drinking less but that doesn't mean that people don't want to go to pubs. I don't why people don't understand that. And if a pub has a great alcohol free offering, you know, everything from soda to kombucha to alcohol free beer, wine and spirits. I mean, there's alcohol free draft beer now. And um, people 
if you can say you can still come and have a pint and have that experience, but it's 0.5%, um, that's going to be a draw. And may, ensuring that you've got customers coming in regularly, repeatedly, that's a part of sustainability as well. It's an absolutely massive topic. I mean, in terms of energy usage, um, looking looking to breweries that are using less tea, but if you're buying from a small and independent brewery, that footprint is is uh, marginal anyway. Um, looking after every element of the business, it's all part of sustainability. It's gonna it's gonna be. This is a topic that will definitely intensify over the next few years. Yes, uh, as you said, non-alcoholic beer is increasing almost all over the world. In Spain, it has 14% market share. Can you believe? Incredible. Uh, and we just learned from the Heineken announcement. Now it's on the draft. Interesting, and I'm excited to taste it. So, uh, what do you think about the future of non-alcoholic beer? Also, we can answer about the cider. Ciders also increase uh, dramatically. Absolutely. Do you know what? If you'd asked me that question, I would have said something cynical like, oh, it's just apple juice. But now I understand that, no, it's not. It's a very different product. So it's interesting. I got that announcement about Heineken's draft alcohol-free beer. There are actually several solutions for alcohol-free beer. Uh, Heineken is is one of them. It's a familiar brand. But there are some really interesting emerging brands in the UK. Uh, Lucky Saint uh, is one. Uh, Big Drop is another. Uh, regional brewer Adams, their ghost ship pale ale, they serve that on draft in their pubs. And something, uh, this is something anecdotal that um, uh, someone at Adams told me is in, in their pubs uh, in Southwold, they have regular customers that will come in. So ghost ship, it's their citra hot pale ale, it's about 4%-ish. And they'll come in and they'll have a pint of ghost ship, the regular strength. Uh, and then they will have a second pint and they will ask for half a regular strength ghost ship and half an alcohol free blended. And in their third drink, they'll have alcohol free and then they will drive home because they've only had a pint and a half and they've also had their third pint. So they've had time to metabolize the alcohol and they are under the legal limits. And yet they've still managed to go to the pub for three pints. Now I, I will say, um, I don't advise drinking any alcohol and, and driving, but this is just an anecdote of, uh, of how people are, Having draft uh, alcohol-free beer is um, uh, opening the market to these customers. And if you're not preparing to do that in January and, and October, because people go sober for October now, then that that's a huge part of, of how these businesses should be run. Cider as well, um, dra draft alcohol-free in bottles and cans. Something I can I can actually talk about this um, from a different perspective because uh, my younger sister is is pregnant with her first child at the moment and she oh. loves and she loves beer um, and do you know what she she still loves to go out and we naturally gravitate to the places that have a great selection of alcohol free beer mostly in bottle and can um, I think you, I think draft uh, alcohol free is where the opportunity is um, alcohol free spirits. I'm not solely convinced on some of those products yet, but I tell you what, I've had a couple of alcohol-free wines recently that have really kind of changed my perspective there. But it's not just about those solutions. It's about having great um, soda options, kombucha and kefir. There's some really interesting alternatives you can have. Um, and then possibly uh, flavored seltzer, uh, sparkling water. There, I think people are also mindful on calories and sugar as well um so that's 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 also plays a part of it and not just alcohol free beer but looking at how alcohol taxation in the uk is about to change over the next 12 to 18 months um there's going to be an incentive for brewers so they used to have a tax reduction for beer under 2.8 percent now once beer gets under 2.8 percent it starts to get a little thinner and doesn't quite have the body of a, a proper beer but they're changing that tax break to 3.5%, which means you're going to see a lot of beers that were 4% move down to 3.4, 3.5, so that they can take advantage of this tax reduction. Um, I, and I think there's going to be massive innovation in this low alcohol category. Um, and uh, there's so much opportunity there. So, you know, in answer to your question, it's this is going to be where the biggest growth is for me in draft beer. Um, 
over the next year or two. All right. On the other hand, there are different types of beer around the mm -hmm. world. Uh, and we categorize them by flavor, color, ingredients. I'm sure you have tried quite a lot of different beers around the world. Just a few. <laughs> so, what is your favorite one? And for you, what does perfect beer mean? That is, um, you know, people who have listened to me talk before might know what I'm going to say. So the beer that, there is a beer I drank that was the beer that changed me from being someone who enjoyed beer and was interested into it, that was that to someone who is an enthusiast, to someone who couldn't stop thinking about beer. And that beer was uh, in Fort Collins, Colorado, by a brewery called Odell. And, and it's their flagship IPA. It's, um, it's a 7% uh, American IPA with that perfect balance of malt, hops, and flavor. Um, I recently learned the recipe has been altered slightly to it now features locally grown Colorado barley, which it used to be 100% barley imported from England, Marisota. But now uh, something that's happened, there's so much innovation happening in the United States in malt barley. Um, and there's lots of what they're called craft maltsters. There's about 70 of them in the United States now who are working directly with local farmers to produce local high quality malt. And this means certainly for breweries in Colorado that they can buy they could buy barley and wheat that was grown within 30 miles of the brewery and malted in that space too. They could, they could point at the field and go, this is where some of our barley comes from when before they couldn't. So that also ties into sustainability, but something that, so I get to try a lot of beers. I'm, I'm very lucky. I've been uh, uh, around much of the world from the United States to all over Europe um, to Australia, New Zealand, and seen, seen these different beer cultures. And something that always makes draws me to a beer is balance. Yes, I like intensity of flavor. I like bold beers, particularly IPAs. I love them. But I want to taste every ingredient in that beer. I don't just want to taste like a, a wall of hops that I have to scale to enjoy this beer. I want to taste that barley. I want to taste that water profile. If the the brewery is using a yeast that has a character. I don't want that to be hidden. I want that to be integrated into the, into the beer. And the best beers are balanced. Another beer that I love is um, from uh, Franconia, from Bamberg in Germany, and it's called Au, and it's by Marsbroi, um, which is one, you know, it's a century-old, family-owned brewery in Bamberg that just makes incredible lagers. And yes, you can sit and drink them and not think too much about them, but actually they have so much complexity of flavor. But it'd be remiss of me if I didn't mention um, some cask ale. <laughs> you know, cask is something I've had an interesting relationship with over the years. These days, I am a member of Camera, and they publish my latest book. And actually, seeing how they work internally, I think their work is important, uh, really vital to the sustainability of, of English and British brewing traditions. Um, and some... I've been enjoying a lot of cask beer recently, but there's a young brewery here in Manchester called Track, and they make a beer called Sonoma. It's an American hot beer inspired by California, but it's also a pale, bitter cask ale brewed in a very Manchester tradition, and it's 3.8%. It's, it's just glorious. It tastes of um, orange peel, pine resin. It, it's, it's absolutely wonderful so it's and you can only really get it on cask if you come to manchester so i encourage people to do that matthew which part of england uh the cask consume most so i would say cask ales consume most. it's interesting because i lived in in london for 15 years and people drink a lot of cask ale in london and, and there's a lot of cask ale available in london but i relocated to manchester just over a year ago and here in the north, not just in the northwest where I am, but in, in when I say the north, I mean everywhere from uh, Lancashire to Yorkshire, up to the northeast to Cumbria, people seem to choose Cascale more often than down south. Um, my experience drinking it regularly here is that the beer is better quality because it's fresher, because pubs are selling it faster. Throughput is essential. All right number one thing in cask ale 
is, is, is not just cellaring, but throughput. You want to sell that um, a nine gallon is the typical uh, measure. So 72 pints. So then you'll probably get about 70 um, out of the cask after losses if you're lucky. Um, but if you can sell that in 24 or 48 hours and then have the next one ready, that beer is going to stay fresh. If that's going to be on for four or five days, that beer is going to start tasting tired. And returning to London, even to some of my favorite pubs, I had a few pints. That I'm like, you know what? There are some pubs in London that do cask incredibly well. The Southampton Arms, the Sutton Arms, the Pembury Tavern. I know where to go for good cask. But in Manchester, there's no lottery. I can walk into almost any pub doing cask. And because more people drink it here, the beer generally seems to be fresher. And it's something I didn't believe was true when someone told me it when I lived in London. And now I've experienced it. I'm like, yes, the, the cask here is better because people drink more. Okay. So, Matt, coming to pubs are one of the UK oldest and most popular social institutions. Mm -hmm. They host so many community-oriented events, activities in social lives. However, they are currently under pressure and Uh, according to some numbers, 16 pubs closing every week. So what do you think about the community pubs in today's world in UK? I think um, something that one of the reasons pubs are closing is because our culture has changed a little bit. More people are drinking at home. And there's a few factors for this. Let's put let's let's ignore the pandemic. I, I want to ignore the pandemic for, for five minutes. So let's put that to one side. Even without that, pubs were in decline. And that's because people were drinking at home. Let's look at the reasons for that. The first one is that the the difference in margin, in price between a beer in national retail and grocery versus on, on the on trade has been widening. The big retailers, the supermarkets, uh, they have great quality beer. The selection in, in some of the big grocers is incredible. And you can go, go and buy some of the best beer in the world and take that home. But you'll pay three, four, five times more if you want to go to the pub. Historically, this was not the case. You, If you wanted to drink beer cheaply and at volume, you would have to go to the pub. So this has seen a massive shift. But I also think culturally, the pub has become a different space because the way we work in the UK The kind of work we do, if you think back to um, the, the post-war 60s and 70s, when there was a lot of industrial jobs, mining, steelworks, that kind of thing in these northern cities, the way pubs work there is that people, pubs would sell one type of beer. They would have like, you know, for example, in Leeds, they would have Tetley's or in Sheffield, they would have Stone's. Here in Manchester, you have Holt's, Hyde's and Lee's, quite a few family brewers. But people would go, finish work, you know, at the same time every day, and they would go and they would drink eight pints, and then they would go home. They would they were drinking massive volumes. This isn't the culture anymore. We're now a culture of people who who talk on Zoom. We work in offices, and we might go out for a drink after work, but we're not going to go out for eight pints as a normal habit. Not in the UK anyway. Um, and that has largely led to decline. I think the other thing that has uh, also led to the decline is the the price of property. I think this is something that's that's uh, often um, not looked at is that there are most of the pubs in the UK are owned by large chains. You wouldn't know it because they all feel like a normal pub, but you have um, groups like Star Pubs and Bars, Mitchells and Butlers. Um, only yesterday, the news was announced that Punch, with over a thousand pubs, was acquired by a US private equity firm. And You have to wonder what you know if if these um, if these are freehold or leasehold properties and the, the pub is not selling enough beer if it's losing money what's this business going to do well it's probably going to sell it and it's probably it probably wants to sell it to developers so there are everything is against pubs it's such a challenging market but that doesn't take away from me the importance of these places which is why they need to be protected for me they're part of the fabric. Of, of British culture. And I think generationally, there's a realization, certainly, you know, as a, as a millennial, just about at 38 years old, more, more and more, the older I get, the more I value pubs as a space. And I see that in my peers, people who are my age, they look at pubs and go, actually, these are great spaces. Coming back to the pandemic, that made us realize that when we were in our homes, 
in lockdown, unable to to go out to these places, we were start, starting to think, wow, I forgot how much just that experience, just going to the pub for an hour, seeing a friend, having a beer, having a glass of wine, having a cocktail, that is great for our well-being. And I think more and more people realize that. And hopefully um, for all the challenges pubs face, uh, if enough people remember to, to get out there and use their pubs when they feel safe to do so, then um, the best pubs, the ones that really put the effort into great service, great selection, put having a great vibe, then they will survive. All right. Let's jump into the from historical coming to pubs to new world, metaverse. <laughs> For example, Heineken is developing a new project called MetaServe, you know, establish its presence in Metaverse. And uh, we also see ABI announcements in Metaverse. What would you think about infusing pop culture into the Metaverse and where it could go? Uh, when you I had a good think about this, you know, um, I have spent a lot of time recently um, trying to understand um the blockchain crypto culture nfts I, i i am not in i'm not invested in it um but i i want to understand it and what why it exists and why you know i have i have friends who have started trading cryptocurrency and i'm like I, it's nice that you have the money to do that all but... of my friends doing that <laughs> <laughs> i i don't um certainly as, as a as someone who as someone who creates things um i've been trying to understand nfts specifically um and um i'm not going to say my opinion uh, on it because i'm still i'm still working it out but i i wouldn't buy i wouldn't buy one um i i would buy a painting to hang in my house that you know i i, I believe in 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 fungible tokens not non fungible ones um but in terms of pub culture let's come back to what we were just talking about in that pub space so and the lockdown so something that happened to me and i'm sure happened to many of the people watching this during lockdown is that we missed having a drink together so we would go on platforms like zoom and we would have drinks together and you know what when lockdown first started i really didn't like it i was like this is weird i don't i'm sitting in front of my computer um but as time went on and i missed my friends and i missed that experience i gradually grew into it and i had some really nice nights on zoom and then in april this year i went to an actual pub that you know we sat outside and i thought this is so much better pubs are physical spaces i don't know what the metaverse is, is going to look like i still uh, uh, you know i i as someone who's been on the internet and and played video games i i appreciate online the existence of online spaces they've been there for me for a long time i have played video games against people on the other side of the world that's a great use for this and the metaverse seems great but Is having a pint with someone with your virtual avatar and their virtual avatar in a virtual pub going to replace sitting in a nice pub with a log fire and great cascale? Never. Absolutely not. Um, maybe not in this generation or the next one. Maybe the one after that, things will be very different. But um, for me, I think it's going to take a lot more than than uh, a virtual world to replace the, the, the magic of a real pub. Generations that are coming, Mr. Matt. <laughs> well, I'll be old and cynical by then, so I'll, I'll, I'll sit in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> so, in your modern British book, actually, you are mentioning craft beer mm -hmm. as a modern beer. What does it mean? Could you give us more details? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I decided to use the word, like, I, and I explained this at the start of the book. I use the word craft beer in my writing quite a lot because, because, The data shows that millions of people understand what that means uh, as, in terms of it's an artisanal product that probably has a bit more flavor than some of the larger brands. But in terms of my book in the UK, we've not really managed to accurately define what craft beer is in terms of the market and business. I know what it means to me. Uh, craft in, in a literal sense is, you know, brewing is the creative side coming up with recipes it's the engineering side working with um equipment and it's the science side the research the yeast management the laboratory work craft is a combination of that artistry that engineering and that science it makes sense to me as a term to use for beer absolutely but i really wanted to control 
the narrative of my book because modern British beer is essentially my philosophy of how beer in the UK has changed over the last 10 or 20 years. And for me, using the word modern beer was a way I could put my own stamp on that. And in the second chapter of the book, I actually write my definition of what modern is. Something that's also important to say is that now the book is out, it's getting less and less modern. That's, that's, that's the point. Modern is always moving forward. But for me, it was a way I could look at uh, quality, um, working with agriculture, working with community, working with diversity, working with sustainability, and working with great flavor and deliciousness. That, that for me are all tenets of modernity. So it was really important for me to put that spin on it. So it's essentially, it was my book. So I decided to, to, to define it in my own way. I love that book, actually. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you for all of your answers, Matthew. Uh, I think I learned so many new things, and I'm sure our audiences also too. So right now, Q&A session, and uh, we can take the questions. You can write it. Then I will convey it to Matthew. Great. So... The first question for Tobias Mandrina. What is your favorite pub in your country or let's say all around the world? So um, I'll pick one in London, one in Manchester, and then I'm going to pick one in the United States um, because uh, I do travel a lot. But um, in London, my favorite pub at the moment is called the Sutton Arms. And I, my, pub in, my favorite pubs always change because I'm that kind of, I'm quite fickle. But the Sutton Arms, it's near Barbican, so it's quite central, but it's in a place where uh, most people work rather than live. So it doesn't really open on weekends. It's a week, weekday pub, but it's been family owned for two generations. Um, it has amazing beer. It just, when I try and describe a pub with good vibe, the Sutton Arms is dripping with vibe from the carpets to uh, the old wooden bar top. It's just full of character. Um, it's also really near a great Czech beer bar called Pivo, so you can do both on the same trip. Um, and at the Czech bar, you can get uh, the uh, the schnitt and the, the liquor pour, which you, most pubs in the UK don't do, but I enjoy. But the Sutton Arms, that's my first pick. In Manchester, the pub I have been going to the most is called the City Arms, uh, and it is a fantastic, warm, cosy city centre pub with amazing cask beer. I have started to to make excuses like, oh, well, I need to go into town. I don't really, I just want to go for a pint at the City Arms. Um, it's been under the radar for me at least for a little while, but I, I absolutely uh, love it. Um, and it's also near a great craft beer bar called Cafe Beer Moth, so I can go there as well. Um, and I will be there in January and I hope we will have a chance to cheers there. Absolutely. I'm really curious about that. Absolutely, the first round's on All me. Right. All um, right. And, um, um, so in America, there's this bar I love. Um, it's called the Mayor of Old Town. It's in Fort Collins, Colorado, and it has a hundred taps of beer. Uh, but it's big and busy, so it's, it it works through them. Um, and uh, it, it's a pretty it's a pretty cool place. If you're into beer and you want to try amazing beers, you have a night at the Mayor of Old Town. It's it's pretty special. All right. And second question from Jam Uyanık. I love this surname. Do you know what does it mean? Awake. It means awake. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy asks a very awareful question, actually. He asks that, which one is the worst? The rusty taste coming from the unclean pipes or formless warm beer? So out of those two, I wouldn't want either of them. So something, you know, something that I, I don't like the, the, the rumor that in the UK we serve um, flat warm beer. If you go to the tourist pubs in West London, yes, you will, you will have, you know, when I got to write my book about London pubs, I didn't include any of those for that reason. <laughs> um, but I think, um, you know what, if it's foamless and warm, at least that's not too bad. I, I wouldn't like it, but having beer from dirty lines that's first if i had a, have a beer from a pub that doesn't clean its lines i'll never go back to that pub again it's a fundamental thing of of running running a pub is to ensure that the the fresh 
fresh beer deserves clean lines. So that's the worst. For me, freshness and hygiene first, mm. then the other things come. All right. From Andre Phillips. He says that, can you give us an idea of what is the most popular beers have been during in a lockdown in UK? So I do have some statistics. Um, the most popular beer in the UK is still Carling, brewed by Molson Coors. It's not a beer I drink, although I did have a can of it recently because I like to, I like to familiarize myself with what it's like. You know, I write about beer. I think it's important to have that perspective. Um, but two beers in the craft space, um, I mean, one of them is, is an AB InBev brand, but Camden Hells is doing very well in the UK market. And Brudo Punk IPA. Um, I love it. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's, that's the number one craft beer brand in the UK, but it's being caught up by BV Town's Neck Oil. Um, but uh, my most popular beer in the UK that I was drinking, there's a small brewery in the south of England called Elusive, and they make a West Coast IPA called Oregon Trail. And in lockdown, I drank a lot of that beer because it was very, very delicious and very familiar. Um, so, but it's a, it's such a small brewery; it's a six, much smaller quality than the others I mentioned. But I certainly increased that quality a lot, quantity a lot by by drinking a lot of it. Yeah, thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you so much for your participation, your for your learnings. Uh, thank you, Matthew. <laughs> thank you so great, much. It's great experience to talk with you. <laughs> And hope to see you soon in January in Manchester. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me, Ken. Oh, yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.